Today I'm pleased to have Dr. Eleanor Greenberg as a guest who amongst other things is a renowned psychologist who specializes in gestalt therapy and is the author of the book which I have here that shows up okay that's um, borderline narcissistic and schizoid adaptations which we will be discussing later in the interview so with that being said would you like to introduce yourself yes hi guys it's me just me i'm eleanor greenberg and when i started my practice in 1974 i wasn't aware that about half of my clients would turn out to have what were called at the time personality disorders and I'm here today because I did find that out <clears throat> after working with some people that really, really surprised me and I didn't understand what to do. So I went and I started studying the area and I've been studying personality disorders in one way or another. I renamed them as adaptations since about 1975 and I, got so involved with trying to understand what was going on. Most people, when I would go to lectures on personality disorders, they would be talking about borderline. And they would be very discouraging. Way back then in the 70s, that was before Marshall Linehan, that was before we faced many things. And there wasn't a lot of publicity. And people tried to discourage me from the studies. But eventually, I did find someone that was teaching a different therapy for each of the three main, what were called disorders of the self, James F. Masterson's work. And I studied with them and then went on faculty. I wrote chapters, a chapter for one of Masterson's books on him <coughs> and his approach, excuse me. And I got very interested because he was the only one that I had access to that was teaching about schizoid adaptations. He would call them schizoid disorders of self. And it really was mainly a lovely, lovely man, Ralph Klein, a psychiatrist, who is his director of training, that brought to my, in my understanding, schizoid information on schizoid adaptations to the Masterson Institute. So I'm forever grateful to Ralph Klein in New York City. Uh, if you ever get a chance to study with him, meet him, uh, hear what he has to say, you can read his chapters on schizoid in the book that he edited with James Masterson called Disorders of the Self of the Masterson Approach. And he wrote this, the chapters on the self in exile, chapters one through seven. He does a whole history of the diagnosis and a history of the treatment and where it is from his point of view. So everything that I say is informed by Ralph Klein's work as he integrated it with James Masterson's work so that there was a consistent object relations, personality, and self-focus to it. I'm a Gestalt therapist. So then I translated everything eventually into Gestalt therapy terminology, which is based to some extent uh, on a very different model where they interacted. And I'm talking about this first because one of the confusing things about trying to understand any personality disorder from the lay person's point of view is you are not usually told that there is one, more than one valid theory and more than one valid approach. And I was absolutely horrified when I looked up schizoid personality disorder in the DSM-5 because the DSM-5 is not really a personality disorder manual or attempt to teach it. They simplified it and they only discuss what can be counted and is visible. Now, 99% of the people I know who have made schizoid adaptations, even though I'm an expert, I cannot recognize as schizoid. They keep it to themselves. They have a very good front. They know how to integrate themselves and uh, not appear to 
different or to call undue attention to themselves. So that means in the DSM-5, where most of you will first come across schizoid, they only have a description of someone that I consider entirely broken who has given up. And therefore, you can see their um, idiosyncras the idiosyncrasies and defenses, more or less. You see something. And that is not what I'm doing. Uh, there are different views, and I'm taking an object relations mixed with Gestalt therapy perspective. And then spe spe specifically, I'm taking James Masterson and Ralph Klein's perspective on schizoid. You will read about other perspectives. Sometimes it's useful, not the DSM-5, but anyone else's. You might get something that you identify with. And you might not identify totally with the one that I'm taught and that I'll be talking about today. So I wanted to make that very clear. No one knows what a schizoid is, but a person suffering or adapting to that situation. You're in you. I'm not in you if you're listening to this. The other people, most of the people, I didn't ask their diagnosis who were writing on this. I always thought I wouldn't have to because I thought some brilliant person who had um, adapted and who internally understood schizoid personality disorder based on their personal experience would come forward and say, like Marshall Lenahan did for the borderlines, I was schizoid. I know what it's like. I know my version of it. I know how to heal and get rid of a lot of the pain that we people with schizoid adaptations have. But nobody came forward that uh, obviously. So I reluctantly started teaching what I had learned from the outside, from my clients and from the Masterson Institute and from the reading of Fairburn and Harry Guntrip. Harry Guntrip paved the way for everybody, <laughs> I think, all the different types and subtypes. And so you can read Harry Guntrip. So I am speaking to you today from the outside looking in. And that's very important because I won't see everything that other people will see. So that is the perspective that I'm taking today. Now, from, do you have a question, Penzi? From no, I just I just wanted to say that um, from looking at your work, I found it to be very clear and very relatable, and it really does hit on the key point. I think so. Um, though you're talking like about the external perspective, there is like really a lot of deep understanding, and I I imagine from your experiences working in the field that a lot of that is amassed even further along with um, studying with Ralph Klein and um, looking into um, Guntrip and Thurburn. So I just wanted to say that like I found you to have a very deep underst like a good understanding like of schizoid. So yeah. Thank you. So I also found after I studied it that I had cousins who I believe fit the diagnosis. And of course, I had many friends who I knew, I kind of knew enough about it. My first introduction to the schizoid diagnosis was rather startling. And it was back in the 60s when I was in college studying psychology. A dear friend of mine came to me and said, will you do us a favor? You're the only person we know that knows any psychology. Our friend Michael here went for therapy. He came back after his interview and intake with a sealed envelope with his diagnosis that he's supposed to give to the therapist they assign him. Would you tell us what the diagnosis means? Well, it was, we had to steam open the envelope. Okay, that's how private these things were. And I look at it and I'm horrified. It said, my dear friends, my friend who loved Wagner's Ring Trilogy, who was sarcastic, funny, and gay, and, um, you know, just an interesting person, 
harmed no one except perhaps by making just sarc good sarcastic jokes, but we were all college students. What did they say his diagnosis is? They said he was a pseudoneurotic schizoid with psychopathic tendencies. We were really scared. Doesn't that sound scary to you? I had no it idea does. what that meant. Mm -hmm. That's what they were calling. So uh, now from the perspective of all the study and learning and listening to people, this was the translation. At one time, they thought that all personality disorders were going to become psychotic and they just looked more normal than they were. That wasn't happening. And they were calling my, my friend, pseudo-neurotic because they believed that they didn't really have a grasp of the personality disorder array yet and who was who and what was what. So they said he looks, essentially it meant he looks more normal than he is and he might become psychotic with the implication. That was a discredited uh, thing in the 60s, the 50s, some people, I forget their name, put forth that people were pre-schizophrenic. And so you were seeing symptoms that later on would be in, become more severe in schizophrenia. So that was possibly part of the implication. That didn't happen. And why psychopathic tendencies? So far as I know, at, the only reason was at that time, it was still considered a psychological disorder to be gay. And that was the only thing I could think of. I, you know, I didn't know any laws. Other than smoking pot, I didn't know of any laws Michael had broken to be called, anti, you know. Uh, it's extreme, pot. isn't it? I thought it was a very, very extreme, very depressing, uh, very unenlightened way to talk about someone. And it was very pathologizing, which I really, really didn't like. I went on to study Gestalt therapy, which went so far against pathologizing that it refused to teach us diagnosis. The um, very, very over-optimistic view of the founders, Frederick and Laura Pearls, and the later well-known Gestalt therapists was that if we were good enough, we wouldn't need to diagnose. We would stay in the present, and we would attune to the person and we would come up with interesting interventions that would increase their self-awareness. And that even stranger, that we didn't have to teach anyone about transference phenomena, like you asked me about projective identification and things like that. Well, in Gestalt therapy, we weren't taught transference at that time in the early 70s because I was told when I asked about it, because I had read Freud, so I wanted to know about transference. And they said, well, we're going to use first names. We're going to be sitting opposite people. We're going to be treating them as I vows, Martin Buber's concept of we are equals. We may have different roles, but we're essentially equal human beings with, uh, without a hierarchical relationship to each other. And therefore, it will be difficult for anyone to have a transference on to us. We will dissolve the transference in each session. Well, they didn't tell us how we were going to dissolve transference in each session, and that escaped me. So this is the long way around. I started learning about personality disorders, um, but I didn't know at that time, this was before Masterson, about schizoid. A man came to me, a couple of people came to me. I referred them on to the Masterson Institute because I heard they were treating schizoid personality disorder, which they called a disorder of the self. All of these were disorders of the self to Masterson. That was his preferred term. I changed to adaptations, but I go back and forth because when you try and look up information for yourself, as many of my schizoid clients were great researchers and they like to do their own research, trusting very few people to do it for them properly, uh, you will find that all you get under schizoid adaptations is me or people who I trained, and you won't find Harry Gunship's work or 
uh, Masterson's work or anything like that. So I go back and forth from personality disorder to adaptation with the understanding that you need to know how to look it up. Because in the beginning, I didn't know where to look this up. I didn't know what the name was. I certainly wasn't going to use the diagnosis. I should have tried, I guess, the diagnosis they gave to Michael, but it didn't occur to me. So that's why you'll hear me going back and forth. I think adaptations because getting to the origin of what is schizoid, it can be understood best by thinking of a baby. A baby comes into this world entirely dependent on the mother or the mothering person who's ever in that role. And all it can do is uh, cry or not cry, gurgle, and the mother, I'll say mother, but it's anybody who's taking the role of the mother. It doesn't have to be a female. It doesn't have to be the literal biological mother. It's the person on the one-to-one -one going to have this big, big impact. The, the, the steady caretaker of this infant is going to have to figure out what this infant wants. It's uncomfortable because it's crying. Do I feed it? Do I diaper it? So what's required is what we call attunement not doing what we think, but trying to tune into this kid and try different things and look at its face, look at its behavior. When it stops crying, we know we hit, and when it starts looking a bit more relaxed, we know we did the right thing. This takes a lot of energy. Not every caregiver has the energy to be that tuned in most of the time. We don't need 100% attunement. We need good enough mothering. That came from one of the theorists in the field. And that if we do good enough mothering, there'll be a lot of times the child feels well taken care of. But occasionally when the mother is absent or not attuned, the child will be encouraged to reach out for him or herself, for themselves, depending, Put any pronoun you like to this or no pronoun to anything I say in my speech. English, it's hard to do without pronouns, without making everything plural. So I'll do my best. But consider it, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is not about gender or sex, any particular one. This is every single baby and every single mother. Now, if you have if the baby reaches out and tries to do what it needs, self-soothe, whatever's within its power. But the earlier the lack of attunement occurs, the less power the baby has to do anything at all. All it can do is be with itself alone and cry itself to sleep, or if it's old enough, play with a crib toy. Now, my clients who later made schizoid adaptations, they had um, inadequate attunement for their particular needs. Now, this gets a little complex because um, Stella Chess and her husband, uh, Stella and Tom Thomas and Chess, I forget his first name, they looked at, they did a longitudinal infant story uh, study about 20 years to, to discover the role of temperament and the role of the parent meshing together what made it easier to parent particular children, what made some people who were good parents to one child, a bad child, a bad parent for another child. And they found that there were some children at birth that were more sensitive in one way or another, and they were harder to parent. And the average parent could do well with the average child, be a good enough parent. So it's not always that there was a malevolent parent. Sometimes you, Stella, uh, Chess and Thompson, Thomas's theory was that there was a mismatch between what the parent could offer and wanted to offer and what the baby and the child needed and wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And when you get this mismatch, you get inadequate parenting. Now, it could they, some children were, were very, very sensitive. Some children had allergies. Some children had uh, other kinds of what I call pluses. They had 
autism. They had uh, some form of some other digestive problems. It could be anything at all from psychological to physical, but there was a lack of attunement and that lack of attunement continued. And the earlier the lack of attunement started, the more damaged the child was in my experience. Now, some kids were super kids and when in their, it, with resilience, they were so easy to parent that they, if they didn't get it from one parent, they, they could find it, uh, they survived some very difficult situations because of their own nervous system. And that made right, their right. parents look like better parents than their parents actually were very often. Yeah. And I, I, I've met someone like this. You know, I, I had a gay client uh, who, uh, he, F, his grandfather was the only person that tuned to him. And when his grandfather died, he, he was five. He was in a small town. Homosexuality was not accepted. He was from a religion and a group that uh, were ashamed of homosexuals if you had one in the family. He had nobody in, to talk to. He had nobody to comfort him. And he felt neglected and all of this. So he was very resilient though. What did he do? He looked at movie magazines and he identified with people who had made it. Um, he looked at, he read about singers. He identified with Cher because she didn't come from a sophisticated background. Anyone that came from a small town with bias, he and what later was able to find a, a good life for himself, he liked to read about because he could take that in as hope. Now, my the, the normal average person who's a child who might not be quite that resilient, and he had his own problems. He wasn't problem free, he was in therapy with me, but he uh, had managed to find for himself, even at a slightly older age, because he had to be able to read to do that. Uh, he, he'd had some good attunement earlier, but most of my clients uh, by the age of three were already uh, not getting what they needed. And some of them were being actively abused. Some of them were being neglected. Some of them were simply misunderstood or scapegoated or uh, it wasn't pretty. The re when I was studying this with Ralph Klein, he reported that his clients and many other people's clients who had made schizoid, who had schizoid disorders of the self by the age of seven had already decided that there is nobody that cares about me that will take care of me the way I need to be taken care of. I am going to have to take care of myself. I have to prepare to be alone. I have to prepare from now on to take care of my own needs and to get out of here as soon as possible. I'm going to save my money. I'm go not gonna ask anybody for anything. And one day I will be independent and I will find somebody, these are my more hopeful clients, who will understand me, who will get me just the way I am. And I will be loved and I will be understood and I will not be terrorized. I will not be intruded upon. I will not be what is mine will not be taken from me, appropriated, because my clients knew appropriation and they knew neglect and they will not abuse me and everything will be fine. So now they have a plan. And some of you out there listening, you might want to think about if you think you fit this diagnosis, which I'll talk about the criteria for, but many of you watching this already have some familiarity. Uh, see, remember, see what you remember of your childhood. Was there a time when you recognized? Now, seven's an interesting age because I have two grown children and um, two grandchildren. And before you get, uh, it's very hard to conceive of the larger world and the big picture 
because before age seven. By age seven, you have the beginnings of the cognitive apparatus in your brain that allows you to see the, um, more than your family. You can grasp that there's a world, you may not know it, you may not know the names of other countries, of other peoples, but you can grasp that there's a world outside the family unit. <clears throat> you've been to school, you've seen differences, you've interacted with teachers, you may have interacted with more distant family members. And so, that, so there's something about that age that's very, very interesting. Now, what am I saying is schizoid? In order to understand what I mean, well, first I'm going to ask you, Pansy, uh, whether you think I should continue as I am or whether you have a question that you think your listeners will be. Oh, um, um, continue as you are. Okay. So what makes someone uh, get diagnosed uh, with a schizoid diagnosis? From, and I, I use <coughs> mostly an object relations system diagnosis. That is why I studied with Masterson. I had looked at uh, many different approaches to personality disorders. But the object relations approach, what I was looking for is I had been reading a book uh, called Neurotic Styles by David, um, maybe David Shapiro, I forget his last name at this point, it was many years ago. It's a very interesting little book, but I didn't know the difference between neurosis and personality disorders. So I went looking for somebody who could teach me what's the difference. I went looking for a theory that it had a clear differentiation so that I would, I would understand this group has this type of problems, this group has this type of problems. I would understand the fuzzy, there wouldn't be so, it was really fuzzy. When I, why was it neurotic styles in this book? Why was it a personality disorder in this book? Why was my friend, pseudo-neurotic schizoid with sociopathic tendencies in, from someone else's book. So that was my test. I went with my lantern of truth, <laughs> looking for a mentor, a teacher who would assist him something. I flew back and forth from, to Harvard, continuing ed from New York. I was like a person, a nutty person. You know, I was driven. I was obsessed. I took, I studied, um, uh, Many, many, I, I took classes at all the different schools I could find that had classes on this, and I didn't understand some of them. So I hope you understand me today because I had an, I took an oath after my journey that this could mostly be said in plain English and explained so that everybody understands. The reason there was, it took me so long is they were speaking in jargon. Uh, and I'm going to use some jargon today, and it's really unfortunate, but forgive me. I'm going to be talking. The reason I went to Masterson is object relations had my answer, and this is the answer. And forgive the jargon. If a person has whole object relations on object constancy, they do not, qua they do not qualify for any form of personality disorder diagnosis. They are not borderline, narcissistic, or schizoid. They may have every trait. They may be unpleasant as all hell. They may be abusers. They may be uh, inflexible. You may hate them, but they don't have a personality disorder. Is that, is that like sort of standard across the board then? If you have whole object relations, then it's kind of impossible to be diagnosed with a personality disorder. By an right? object relations theorist. If By you an object on, relations theorist. That's right. That's where the line is. Now, Otto Kernberg is an, Otto Re is an object relations theorist, very well known, very complicated to understand, I find. And so every so often I think about, he's about 89, 90 now. He's probably not teaching, but he has YouTubes. You can check them out for yourself, see if there's something that mm -hmm. interests you. But I ended up with Masterson because I read his books and I could understand them, barely. I went to his conferences to understand what was he saying. And they were doing their best to put it in 
they were the conferences were for professionals. So understand, here I was, I had a bachelor, master's, and a PhD in psychology. I was already licensed as a psychologist. I was I had read a lot of Freud. I had read a lot of people. I'd taken lots of courses, and I still found learning personality disorders extraordinarily difficult. Therefore, when I see these people guessing on the internet, you know, arguing with each other about things that they had never studied, I'm kind of horrified because if I couldn't understand it, I'm a Mensa member. Do I go to meetings? No. But so I know I'm also smart, but this stuff was complicated. And some of the reason it was so complicated was the language. So when I was told this statement about personality disorders and whole object relations, I said, what's whole object relations? That sound, I'm interested in people. I'm not interested in objects. And that's what everybody says to me. Why objects? And so I'll tell you first what whole object relations is. It's actually super sinful. It's black and white thinking taken to the max. Right? We've all heard of that. It's no gray, no area in between, no other colors. So it's also splitting. You've heard the term splitting, splitting good from bad. So the person sees you as either all good or all bad. That's if you don't have whole object relations. You can't, if you don't have whole object relations, you can't see anyone in an integrated, stable, realistic way. Uh, and you can't see yourself that way. You see yourself as some version of all good or all bad, depending upon the day, the moment, the time, the feedback, and how damaged you are. Some people see themselves as all bad, and it's pretty stable, and they're harder to help. And some people see themselves as all good. Some people switch back depending on who they're with. So whole object relations is the ability that children normally get by age five, usually by age four often. I watch my grandchild as she was getting it once I understood what it was. And also object constancy is the ability to see that the person you love and the person you hate sometimes is exactly the same person. And they have both liked and disliked aspects. That, and you can tolerate their disliked aspects because overall, you love them. Or they have better aspects that are important to you. So the child before then, if you think back to the descriptions of kids at the terrible twos, you see these kids yell, yelling, having tantrums in the supermarket. I hate you, mommy, buy me candy. I hate you, you're the worst mommy in the world. What's going on? That child, no, that does not have whole object relations. Mommy is all bad because mommy is not buying the child candy and the child is frustrated and tired and doesn't like to, to be sitting there in the shopping cart waiting for mommy to pay for things is totally like, do you remember being a kid? I was like bored out of my mind. Bored, bored around adults all the time. It was like the most boring thing. Finally, I learned to read, thank God. And um, so that same kid goes home and mommy takes, gives him a hug, feeds him, makes nice. Oh, mommy, I love you. You're the best mommy in the whole world. So now mommy is all good. So eventually, somewhere that the terrible twos, it's that switching. You need mommy. You can find a lot of information, formal information about this. Masterson relied to a great extent on a lot of infant theorists. And the one that was testing the idea of borderline personality disorder starts at the age of two, around two. And that explains the terrible twos when the child wants to be independent, can speak somewhat and has preferences, but also wants mommy or the caretaker available when they want to be babied and when they get scared. And that's a big switch. One a mommy you've been causing a been a pain to all day at the supermarket and shopping. Now you want to cuddle you. Well, back to attunement. A good mother will attune. Now, Margaret Mahler, Mahler, Pine, and Bergman, the psychological birth of the human infant, um, dated the borderline 
the acquisition, the beginnings of the acquisition of borderline personality disorder between 14 months and about 22 months, 24 months. And that they actually set up a free nursery for uh, mothers with children that age and filmed them and with the permission that was with a payback for getting the good nursery. And then they were allowed to use the films for their studies and it was written up in Mahler, Pine and Bergman. And they called that subphase when the child is about in that age from 14 months to about two. Now, again, bear with me, the rapprochement, rapprochement subphase of separation and individuation. Okay. Mouthful. <laughs> Uh, a mouthful. So this is why it. This is why we, you wonder why we don't have more therapists studying personality disorders. How many of them can say with a straight face the rapprochement of phase of separation and individuation um, in Margaret Malapine and Bergman's system <laughs> as the precursor to borderline personality disorder? I mean, come on, give me a break. Impressive. That's very impressive. That is. No. I'm well, impressed. <laughs> thank you. And there's, it's all that confusing. So I, I, I took a vow of plain English uh, <laughs> and that I would bring this uh, as best I could so that more people, my book was written originally for therapists because I wanted to make it easy for therapists to treat people with personality disorders. I didn't think it had to be this hard. I thought if, we gave, if I gave them what I knew, the basics of what I knew, and good clinical examples in straight English. And then I wrote a glossary for all these awful terms. And I put it at the end of my book that more people would be uh, willing to, uh, and would be effective, would, be, would ha have some understanding of how to diagnose and treat uh, borderline narcissistic and schizoid adaptations. And so I did that, but I found half the people, but I was successful because pretty much everybody who was interested in the topic, whether they were in my field or not, could read the book. And almost everyone told me they could understand it and they could go to my glossary. So I feel that's a success. Now, why am I harping on borderline when I'm talking about schizoid? Well, when does schizoid, schizoid people are more damaged than borderline people. That's my experience. So that dam to be more damaged than a borderline, if borderline starts around two and a half and, can and you continue with that family and whatever they were doing that you made a borderline adaptation by two and a half, that's so inconsistent or not, not, you know, not attuned to your personal needs, the, um, my borderlines mostly have basic trust. They don't feel. They don't always feel unsafe. Right. Okay. Right. So we're okay. talking. My estimate, and these are estimates. You can't ask the child, "Are you making a schizoid adaptation?" Especially before the age of when they can talk. But right. it is estimated that the schizoid adaptations start before the borderlines. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of controversy over when narcissism starts. Now, can you get a schizoid adaptation later in life as an adult? No, because it has to, these personality disorders by definition start when the personality is forming and it becomes, it, it becomes tangled in with your natural personality. And therefore it's very hard to untangle. That's what makes the therapy long. People are very resistant and confused about one thing about the schizoid diagnosis and before i end i want to explain that do we have time pensy for um, me yeah that's that? sure yeah i'd love that mm -hmm. people hear schizoid they think schizophrenia or they think schizoaffective disorder they think because schizo that you're split all schizo is is a lot the it's a prefix it's a latinized version of a Greek word that means split or divided. And it was given to a number of person of, of mental uh, disorders, let's just say, psychological issues. And so if you tell someone you're schizoid, they may think you're schizophrenic. Schizophrenia mm -hmm. is a psychosis with a very strong genetic component that we don't truly understand. If two identical twins, uh, the, the average 
Across the world for schizophrenia is about 1% of the population. If you have a schizophrenic relative, that average goes up. If you're in a subgroup that inbreeds a lot, you're going to have a higher level of schizophrenia, but it's still not going to be extraordinarily high. But if you have a, an identical twin, it's called a monozygotic twin, that where one egg with one sperm breaks into two identical parts. The strange part is if one of the twins that's genetically identical to the other becomes schizophrenic, on average, with all the twin studies they've done on schizophrenia, the other twin has, on average, a 46% chance of becoming schizoid, a schizophrenic. But we don't know why. And people who have looked at all sorts of reasons. Um, I edited, I'm an associate editor of Gestalt Review, and we devoted an entire re uh, Gestalt Review issue to schizophrenia. So in any case, um, it's schizoid is not schizophrenia, and schizoaffective is schizophrenia plus a mood disorder, which is worse. You could be bipolar in schizophrenia. And I had a client who it took three years in mental hospitals before they could find medications. She was schizoaffective. And she came back into therapy for advice on how to manage her remaining symptoms and lead a normal life as best she could, but she was still paranoid. She still believed people could read her thoughts. My, so be aware that when, uh, if someone's, first of all, when you're looking for this information, there's a lot of fakes on the internet. So look at the person's credentials. Some of the fakes mean well, they think they know something, but they don't. And you can get very confused. So it's very important to understand that schizoid is not schizophrenia. It's not going to become schizophrenic. Um, it's not pre-schizophrenia. It's not schizo schizotypal. That's a different disorder too. And it's not schizoaffective. Okay.